Welcome back to Focus to Win Podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce a very special guest, someone that Orioles fans know so well. He's been the voice guiding us through some of the most exciting moments in recent Orioles history, and his play-by-play commentary keeps us all on the edge of our seats. So with years of experience broadcasting, including minor, minor league baseball and college baseball, he's become an integral part of the Orioles nation. He's been with them for 10 years. Please join me in welcoming the voice of Orioles radio broadcast, Jeff Arnold. What's Jeff, going how on, Lee? How are we doing today? Great. Yourself? Good. We're uh, yeah. we're taping this and uh, or putting this together, and I'm in the uh, Outside of Detroit, Michigan, getting ready for our series against the Tigers, which starts tomorrow, and then uh, today's an off day. So good to spend nice. some time with you. There, yeah, great to see you. And you know, three a.m. flight in is always a, a pleasure, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know. It's just it's part it's part of it. But uh, you know what? Only a couple of road trips left. Yeah, well, that gets into so you know with the focus to win podcast. I think of so many things, but I think of your schedule in itself, right? You know, you got what one hundred and eighty games that you're traveling for roughly eight months, depending on what's 100, what is 180 plus? With- you know, it, it would probably, for me, it's probably about 150 to 160 games or so. I get time off during the season, which nice. I think is good for me. I think it's also probably good for the audience too, where they can get a break and listen to somebody else or I go over to television. So it, it's a, it's a grind. It's a long season. It's a lot of fun, but I think it's, it's also good to have some breaks in there along the way. So that way, when you get like an Adam Frazier double call, you make sure you nail it because you, you want to be at your best when the game is better the most. Nice. So and, and with our podcast being focused to win, we talk about like, all right, what does it take to get to win? Right. And your schedule is a grind for you and you're traveling for like your home games. And then, you know, sometimes the next game you're some, you're out of the area and traveling somewhere else overnight. And then you're know, back to a baseball game, maybe afternoon or night and so forth. So your schedule very regimen right i I think of mine like i schedule down to the minute for the most part and i can only imagine with yours like you don't have a lot of breaks and it is a bit of a grind so i just want people to mentally think what does that take through the season uh first of all and then let's get into your career path right so your career path on what led you to this journey um tell us a little bit about you know what took you to you know being a broadcaster voicing uh you know on radio so Mm -hmm. share a little bit about it so I'd say that my journey to broadcasting got started by accident. There's some people that they know this is what they want to do from the time they're five or six years old. I was reading this story actually about Marv Albert and his two brothers, all of whom went on incredible broadcasting careers. And Marv's son, Kenny Albert's a friend of mine. And just listening to these people tell their stories they knew they were going to do this from the time they were seven and so they got a head start they knew it was something that they wanted to do for me I didn't really figure it out until I was in college and it more or less was something that I discovered by accident you know when you get to college you're trying to to meet people and get used to your environment and find extracurricular activities that you want to do that are fun And one of them for me was WDCV Sports Broadcasting. So it was a student radio station at Little Old Dickinson College, known for producing lawyers and lobbyists and doctors and finance people, not really known for producing broadcasters. So the nice thing was when you went in and you started to do some games and stuff like that, you realized it's not like Syracuse or Arizona State or any of these other schools where I've got a lot of competition. Nobody's banging the door down to do a Division Three Dickinson College football and basketball, unless you're somebody like me or actually my broadcast partner, Brett Hollander, who, um, strangely enough, is also a Dickinson alum and is wow. years ahead of me. But huh. I stumbled into it by accident, and I remember the, the first game I ever did, it was at Hamden Sydney College, which is down in Virginia, and it was a bizarre mid-season non-conference football game. I still don't know why they were there playing Hamden City College. It was nothing on the line at all. But nobody wanted to go into the game. So I went with a guy that is actually in my wedding this, this offseason. And we became fast friends through that experience. We broadcast the game. And I realized after it that I'm not very good at this, but I think if I did it, I could figure it out. And sure. it kind of just started what was four years of college where I did – football and basketball and baseball and lacrosse. I did a volleyball 
match, which let's hope that no tape of that exists because it was <laughs> really bad. It could probably ruin a career. But no, it's kind of how it started for me. And then once I got out of college, I started to chase this broadcasting journey and try to see where it would take me. And eventually it led me to the Orioles and the major leagues. Well, it's like the iceberg, right? I just think of everybody sees here, this little bit that's above the water, not this much that's below the water to get you that like just over the crest of the line. Um, and this compounding effect of stuff. And I'm glad you said, I was like, I'm sure I was terrible in the beginning, right? None of us come out and are like, Oh, you got the voice for radio. You're perfect. You know, it's uh, yeah. I just think of, especially today's environment, everybody wants immediate gratification, wants it instantaneously, but that's not anything worthwhile is not instant. It's like, you've got to put the work in and it compounds over time, listening to, you know, here you do strictly baseball for the most part right now. Right. But you did all those sports like, Hey, I'm just going to get practice. I'm going to get practice. I'm going to get practice. And I love hearing that because people have to realize like, go get, get good at it. Plus you didn't come into this going, this is what I want. Like you had blinders on. It wasn't that. It was like, hey, I'm open to the world. Let's see what puts what get put what gets put in front of me that I actually get good at that I like doing. And then now look at this path that it's put you on. Um, so going back, so you you said do you is there a time that you remember like your first game? Is there a moment in there that you're calling? You're like, wow, this is this is actually really enjoyable. I really get it. Was there a time that you can remember from that? It was probably like the second half. And then the first half, it's like, all right, you're hearing yourself in the headset. You're having a comment on every single play that's going on. And you're like, am I going to run out of stuff to say? Like, or am I going to be repetitive? And, and then the game got really good. And I think you got lost in it. And I think that's what the best broadcasters tend to do is you're calling a game and it gets exciting and you just get locked into it just like fans get locked into it. And it's just the difference is that they're watching and you're the one talking and, and telling people about it. So I think it took to the second half when I had my legs under me a little bit to realize this is fun and this is something that if I did it a lot and practiced and learn how to prepare and talk to people, this might be a viable career path for me. So especially radio, because you're trying to paint a picture for them to, that they can mentally see, right? So I just think, is, is there um, either something that you've gotten in your training or was there a point that all of a sudden you're like, oh, clicked, like now I get it and now I can paint this picture. Is there something that happened or, you know, what what, what does that look like for you? Well, it takes a while for it to click. That's the thing is like when I was in the minors and it started in Frisco, Texas, the first game that I ever did was Springfield Cardinals and the Frisco Rough Riders. And it was, I think we played six regular season games and I was like our number two broadcaster. So I was like the studio host when they were on the road. And then I would do the home games, calling the games with the guy that I worked with. And I was like, this is really bad. And there's, it, it was no getting around it. It was terrible. And I think that's what most people would tell you when they start doing games. To fight through that and realize it will get better. You just have to make the decision to keep doing it. And so April was bad. May was bad. End of June, there were some signs of life. And I'm like, okay, that's it's getting a little better. And then July was a little better in August. And then by the time I made it to the end of the year, I'm like, all right, for a first year guy who's got a lot to learn still, like made a lot of progress. And then you kind of go from year to year and then you get better and you make more progress and you do this and this. And then, you know, when I was in Frederick doing the Orioles uh, minor league team, you make more progress because now you're also doing a different role where it's you're running your own broadcast, you're handling this, you're doing this and, and so I'd say it took probably five years of doing that and then probably another couple years from the previous two years that I mentioned where I was with other teams where finally about year six, seven, it started to click a little bit. And you started to realize this is what I do well. This is what I don't do well. This is my style. This is what I like to do when I'm doing the game the way that I want to be doing it. And then eventually you get up to the major leagues and then it becomes you got to adjust again and you have to figure out, all right, how do I do a game when there's a pitch clock? How do I do a game when I'm working with this person? How do I do a game when I'm on television versus on radio? 
how do I do a game when I'm in this ballpark? Like Fenway Park, where we're just coming from, it's got a very unique setting. Um, it's got a very unique setting where you're kind of perched over the ballpark like a gargoyle. And so sometimes reading the ball off the bat's a little harder than, say, trying to read it at Camden Yards, where it's very easy to tell what's going on. So broadcasting is constantly about adjustments, just like real estate or life or anything else. And I think the people that are the best are the people that are able to make the adjustments and make them the fastest. Mm -hmm. Um, But also, you know, you know you're good, but I think you also realize you have a lot to learn too. Always. I think we always got to be learning and always adapting, right? I think you're probably still majorly adapting, even though it's been 10 years in with the Orioles, right? It's like, and then you had your college seasons. So I think of, you know, where you started, you started at the college, made it to minor league. Now you made it to the big leagues and the major league. So there's always that path. You're not like people want to shortcut life. Like, oh, I'm going to get right from here to here. And that does that's not the way it works. Especially what I see, unfortunately, a lot of younger generation just impatience. And I'm like, you have to be patient in life. You got long road ahead of you, and which becomes very short when you're looking back. You know, now I'm in my 50s and I'm like, holy crap, look at the how fast the time went by versus, you know, now when you're in it back then in your 20s and 30s, you're like, wow, it's just dragging along. I'm like, no, just enjoy the ride. Um, and the journey where it paints you to wh- where you're going. So you just don't always know, but make sure you're making your course correction and you're learning through all of your mishaps. So, hey, I, I wasn't good. I go back, you probably listen to a lot of audio, fil- like rather than film, you went back and listen to your mm-hmm. audio recordings. What did I mm-hmm. say? We do it in, in our sales. It's like, let's go back and listen to some of our calls. What did we say? How do we get better at it? And it's small tweaks, right? It's not like you're changing a major tweak. It's all these little tweaks that get you so much farther, but you got to put the work in. You 100% have to. And to go back to what you were saying about the instant gratification, I definitely have noticed that with younger people. I guess you could say I'm still probably young, even though I'm in my mid-30s now. And the thing is, in baseball, especially Major League Baseball, everybody talks about it's about getting there sure but once you get there it's how do you stay there and the way that you do that is from what you're describing which is you're listening to stuff you're making a mistake one day and just not making it the next day which is really important and figuring out ways to like elevate your game every day and it's learning from experience and from trial and error and um And just making a mental catalog of, okay, I tried it this way when this happened before and that worked well versus I tried this before and that did not work well. So I think it's just being humble enough to realize that we still have a lot to learn, even though we're we're good at what we do and we've been around a a little while doing this. And it's not it's not always I think at some points you can get lazy. And I mean, baseball's, I think kind of set up where you can get lazy if you if you let yourself be that because mm-hmm. it's such a long season so yeah. like finding little challenges for yourself every day and ways to be better is really important i mean it's the most cliche thing in the world and if if i have somebody ask me a question like how do you get better at, at broadcasting or how do you do this and get to where you want to get to i mean the easiest thing for me to say is try and get better at one thing a little bit every day and yeah. I still follow that where, you know, I'll go back and listen to this, be like, you know what, like that was good. Probably shouldn't do that again. I want to try this. But I also don't want to get too far away from what I do. So it's a constant game of adjustments. It's a game of adjustments for the people on the field. It's a game of adjustments for the people up in the broadcast booth, but the willingness to make those and to try and see if you can take yourself to the next level every day yeah. is, what separates the people who are good at this from the people who are great at this. The few things that you said there was being humble, first of all, taking constructive criticism, right? You got to do that. Mm-hmm. You've got to work on developing yourself, which is I'm sure that you've gone and seeked help. Like who can help me? Who's, who's here? I'm here. Who do I, how do I get knowledge from them? They have the experience and they usually have more gray hairs than I do. How do I <laughs> find that experience from them? to make my, uh, my, my job, my broadcasting so much better for you. Right. So tell me a little bit about that journey. Cause I'm sure there's been a lot there that's, you know, 
a lot there and a lot of people that I help now um, that are trying to reach where I did. And I think that's an important part of this. And I mean, you and I've talked about your experience working with your real estate team and how so much of this is about teaching and developing. You're trying to do your own development, but you're also trying to pass along a lot of vital information that is going to help out your company. And for me, is going to help out our broadcast team and the people that I'm working with and making them better too. Like if I'm doing a good job on my end, that's good. But if I'm also not improving, then it makes it a lot harder for the people I'm working with to be at their best. And that's the goal is like for me to make people I work with as comfortable as possible. So when they're performing, they can be themselves. And if they make a mistake, whatever, but at least they're making the mistake out of I'm doing what I do and I'm being me in this moment. And if I can get you there, like that's, that's the most important thing. But when it comes to like mentors, like I had a a number early on and there's so many, I don't really want to, I don't really want to mention everybody because if I do, I guarantee you I'll forget so many. Right. I'd say right now, like Brian Anderson, who does Turner, who does Major League Baseball in the playoffs and the NBA and did golf and has called golf for years. He's somebody that I lean on and ask advice from and say, hey, can you what do you think about this or what do you think about this or what do you think about this? And, and, and sometimes it's, it's those kinds of conversations about career stuff. Sometimes it's talking broadcasting mechanics. Um, I'd say like with our group right now, like I might talk to Ben McDonald about like different game situations and what happens and why something worked out the way that it did. Like for instance, last night, the Orioles were playing the Red Sox and like Brett Holland and I were calling this game and like between breaks or sometimes while the game is going on, we have a button where we can communicate with each other. Nobody hears what we're saying. And I'm just thinking to myself, we did a good job of hitting all the big points of what was a very strategy filled end of the game where it's, do you make this decision out of your bullpen realizing you have the off day tomorrow? Do you go to this person in this spot or do you use this person a little longer and then you push this person into this spot? Or why is this person not pinch hitting right now? And you're looking in the on deck circle, be like, and then you're looking on Twitter and you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not seeing anything. So I don't know why they're not using this person. So like, it's just so much mental stuff that you're going through. And, and I think that that process has developed over time and, me and Brad and me and my other colleagues are so much better at that now than we used to be. Um, but it's, it's constantly a game of learning and you learn from talking to people like Ben or for me talking to people like Brian and there's, there's so many different areas of this that you're, you're trying to develop and you're trying to grow and improve. And there's certain things that I think you realize that you want to keep this about yourself, but you also want to get your game to the next level. And that might mean, making this little tweak and this little tweak. And it's the type of stuff that most people will never see or never notice, but it can be the difference between a broadcast, which is good. And as I said, a broadcast uh, or a broadcaster, which is great. I think right there, what you said, the small tweaks, right? Like, unless you go back and you uh, give yourself constructive criticism too. Like, Hey, I went back and listened to this and I thought it was good, but how do I get it better? I think if I said this instead, or, um, that, that's like one segment. The other part that you talked about was the mentorship. The more that you help those others, that's probably one of the most fulfilling and most purposeful thing that you get. So I think that, you know, a lot of people don't have either a mentor or look up to somebody they're like, oh, they're not going to talk to me. They're not going to help me. I'm like amazing what just calling that person will do because they're at a different point in their life. And when they give back and help, it is so fulfilling. You like, do you agree with the fulfillment end that you get from helping others? 100%. I've, I've gotten a lot of, I've been surprised about is a number of kids locally who are getting into broadcasting and they're still like high school kids. And they, I had somebody over the Ulster break, send me a demo reel and they're in high school. And I'm like, I didn't even know what a demo reel was when I was in high school. <laughs> and you've already put one together. Like I didn't do this till like I was at the end of college. It was it's a wild experience. It's just wild to see. But um, I, I get a lot of fulfillment out of it. I think sometimes when you mentor people, you're also reminding yourself of things that you need to be mindful of. They're so easy to be forgotten. 
Um, just things that we're talking about, sometimes big concepts like humility and kindness and preparation and attention to detail. Um, it's, you know, attention to detail is a good thing to remember when you're in July or August and you're at game number 98 and you're in, you know, you're, you're playing the, I don't know, the Los Angeles angels and you're on a, you know, three hour time change and you just flew overnight or whatever. And so telling kids about these types of things or younger broadcasters can remind you, Hey, you know what? You probably need to be doing this yourself. And so those are, those are little checks they think on you, but you know, I get a great amount of satisfaction out of doing this and helping people and, and giving them the tools to hopefully live the, live the dream. Because I mean, to me, it's like, if I can do it, then you can probably do it. It's just a matter of how hard are you willing to work and what, lengths are you willing to go to obviously within you know reason like you're, you're not gonna stab anybody in the back or anything sure. like that um but also you're gonna push yourself and rather than go out and have a beer with your buddy when you really need to get your work done for your broadcast the next day you spend that extra hour doing your work okay. to make sure that mm-hmm. that next game is an improvement off of the game that you previous previously did so yeah um, you touched I, on I get a lot, a lot out of it you touched on it earlier too, was that you go back and it's one thing 10,000 times, not 10,000 things one time. Yes. That's a lesson I learned the first year I was doing this. I remember that I was working with this person who was trying to help me figure it out. And they said, well, here's a couple of different things. And I tried to do them all at once. And I'm like, that doesn't work out very well. So when I had one of the first people that worked for me come in and was in a similar spot that I was, I said, you need to just focus on one thing a day, because if you focus on one thing a day and you make improvements and you do that in a couple of days span, then you're ready to move on to the next thing. And once you make that adjustment, then you're able to move on to the next thing. And if you do the one thing a day approach Lee, then suddenly by the end of the month, you've made a lot of progress at a lot of different things, but right. I think isolating stuff to one thing a day, I found that that's a tremendous, tremendous thing to do as far as yeah. self-improvement goes, no matter if it's broadcasting, real estate or, or whatever it is. Yeah. When you think of health and well, like you can't go on a diet and eat one day good out of the month. You got to right. have a pattern of days consecutively before you have a cheat day. <laughs> you know, So it's like build that up and it's no different than this. And, you know, do the things that count, but also focus on one thing at a time, tweak it, make it better. And it's small tweaks as you get on, onward, right? All right. The better that you get, it's really finiting listening for you. It's like, let me see what this sounded like. What did I hear? And even if you had somebody else going back, hey, can you listen to the segment of it? What do you think I could have done differently? And when you get the coaching on it from somebody that's a mentor or somebody that's elevated in the business or like you're saying you you uh, you mute yourself on broadcast so you guys can talk amongst yourselves. That's super helpful because everybody doesn't need to hear that segment of it. They just want to hear the polished part of it. So right, and, and I'll say this too, Lee. Like it's it starts. I think accept you know feedback. I'm not big into the term constructive criticism. I'm, I'm more into feedback because feedback means there's stuff that is good that you're doing that you don't want to change, but there's also things you can tweak and you can, you can do better. And when it comes to finding mentors, at least in the broadcasting field, I don't know how it is in real estate. You want people that are going to tell you the truth. And what I find is that some people that, that I will send stuff to or send stuff to in the past, some would just say, Hey, that's great. I think you're doing awesome. And it's like, great. That's, it's not really helping me all that much. And so whenever I get stuff now from from people, I might take a little longer to get through it. But once I do, I give you a lot of different stuff to think about or focus on because I try and do it in a way that when I was younger, I wanted. I wanted mm-hmm. that kind of feedback. So, so I find that if you just put the extra time in to just listen and really give people feedback and – I think now it's it's kind of hard to do that because there's some people that are, are really good at it. I, I think that former athletes tend to be great at taking feedback. Like Ben McDonald is one of the best in baseball at this. He still wants feedback on his games and is asking. And we'll get into the car after the game and he'll say, hey, what'd you think? Hey, what do you, what do you got for me, Doc? You know, or just 
and and I'll say the same thing. I'm like, hey, what'd you think? How did you feel about it? Like, blah 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 blah. And we'll go from this to this to this to this. And and then there's some people who just you know don't really want that, and and they might be in the minors, or some of them might be in the majors. It's like, no, I'm good. I don't I don't need you to tell me anything or whatever. And you know that you can do it that way if you want, and maybe you won't get burned for it. But um, at least the way I'm wired and the way that that I approach what I do, um, that's not the camp that I want to be in. Yeah, I would say that some of the most successful, like me, I'm, I'm, I love feedback. I, I love mm-hmm. even constructive criticism. I like give it to me. I need to hear what I don't want to hear. Right? How do mm-hmm. I get better? I, I probably don't want to hear the things, but if I'm open to it, like, hey, I'm actually attentively listening outward, not just I'm inward. I'm not paying attention to you. Um, I, I worked. I had a muscle loosening session this morning with Kadri Ismail, our old Ravens player. And he was saying, you know, when I first got there, because I was in pain, like I had messed up my knee and so forth. So I was really inward. And then by the time he started doing some muscle loosening on me, I kind of like was back open again. He's like, you're open and listening to what I'm saying to you. You're kind of defensive in the beginning. I'm like, shit, I didn't even know that. Thank you for telling me it. So like I can feel it, but I didn't realize it at the time. So one of the other things for for feedback would be who we're talking to. I would generally ask them like, can you take, I'm going to give you some, I usually call it constructive criticism. I like feedback right. better because it's less defensive. Like, can you take this? And if you can, great, I'm willing to give it to you. And a lot of them always say yes, but then you start giving it to them and they're like, well, I'm like, uh-huh. I'm, like yeah, I'm, I'm not saying this to make you defensive. I'm saying this to help you. Right. Yeah. The, the yeah, butters, I guess you'd say, yeah, but, and I, I don't know, like, I think generally you can figure that part out pretty soon. And, um, and I, I don't know, like it, to me, it's, this is still a process and like, you know, major league baseball, there's so much on the line every day, but you're still trying to develop every day. And I, I think it's reminding yourself that the development doesn't end once you get there. Like it's not suddenly, all right, I've arrived. All right. See you later. Yeah. I'm good. I've got it all figured out. You don't. And yeah. even the people that have done this so long, they don't have it figured out. I mean, you see older broadcasters in other ways making adjustments to figure out how to do this and appeal to a younger audience. And for me, like I came in and I'm just like, well, let's do this well and this well and this well. And then it becomes, all right, now how do we appeal to this section of the audience that we're getting that's this? How do we do this? What do we do that? traditionally has worked out well in baseball but also how do we find ways to entertain and do this and this and this and make sure that people get to know you as a human being because that's what that's what radio really is and i think broadcasting in general is it's trying to bring people into your your world and radio especially because it's so immediate that you want Mm -hmm. people to realize you're a human being just like they are so no matter what kind of game i'm doing even if it's a tight game like last night you're you're still trying to find ways to let people know that you're a human being and have some fun and make a joke and it might fall flat, but if it does, it's okay. Like we all make dumb jokes all the time and in, in sure. life. So like, let's be willing to take some risks. And I think that all starts with the feedback and the reminder to yourself that, yeah, let's, let's not get lazy here and let's not get complacent. 100%. So um, you, you started going into it, I could have went into it earlier, but game day preparation. So what does that look like for you? And then how do you get ready to call a game? Uh, it's a long process. I'd say that preparation is, is cumulative. Like you're doing a little bit every day and you might stumble across something that you're going to use that night that you prepare And sometimes you're going to stumble across something that you won't use for a month or a month and a half. Sometimes it it comes down to, is the moment the right moment to do what I want to do in this spot? Because broadcasting is largely saying the right thing at the right time in the right tone. Like that's, that's what the best are are really good at. And, and so to kind of get to that spot, it for me begins in the morning and the first day of a series is always the most intense. Like we're playing the Tigers starting tomorrow and we're off today. So today, when you get to the, the off days at the end of the year, you want to take the days of rest. So that way you're mentally in a good headspace to sure. at it the next day. But, but when it comes to like getting ready for that night's game, the first day is the most intense. It's looking at 
the Tigers roster. I started doing that before we flew out last night. I'm like, all right, do I have this guy? Do I have this guy? Do I have this guy? Who are like the big players? What do they do? Who do I really need to know? What storylines are important? Like, are they a playoff team? Are they a non-playoff team? Are they a good offensive team? Are they a good defensive team? Are they a good pitching team? Like, is it a mix of them all? Are they good at this? And is it, they're all good at these things? Or are they good at this, but it's offset by the fact that they're so bad at this? Like, you know, there, there's just a lot of that going on. So you're doing comparisons and then you're keeping yourself updated with what we're doing. And by the time that I get to the ballpark, I have usually I have a word doc and it's uh, notes on every player that I'm going to see. And then I'm going to add some as I go along and we spend time at, with these the, the different broadcasters and you go down to the field and you talk to players and coaches and stuff like that. And and then I also have a page which is basically a note, a section of notes, which is like, this is the Detroit Tigers. This is what their last game was. This is what the trends have been. This is where they sit as far as playoff positioning goes. These are their offensive numbers. These are their pitching numbers. These are the defensive numbers. And then maybe something like this is coming up in a few days. Like when we were at the Dodgers, I had a note about the Shohei Otani bobblehead, which was this massive deal across baseball. And like going into that and, and some stuff about Shohei and his dog, which was part of the bobblehead. And then once I get to the ballpark, like I'll write out my lineup card because I keep you keep score every game. So you write some stuff down and then you go down to the clubhouse and you talk to players and, you know, you might be down there for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, just depending on the day, depending on how much time you have. And then I find that the, some of the best stuff that you get is you go down to the field and, you know, you spend time with Freddie Gonzalez, our bench coach, or Tim Cousins, who's our field coordinator, or Drew French, or Ryan Fuller, one of our hitting coaches, or, or any of these guys that you can say, hey, can you go through this situation last night? Like, we just did this with Freddie Gonzalez two days ago, trying to break stuff down. Hey, in this spot in the game, did you think about doing this? And then he'll say, we did, but here's what you have to remember, too. And then sometimes they can fill you in on stuff that may not be for air, but at least you can be like, all right, at least my process is right. So yeah, connecting um, dots. Yeah. yeah. And so once you're done with that, then you go eat and then we tape some stuff for our pregame show. And then the broadcast kicks off 30 to 40 minutes before we get started. And uh, off we go. Um, so if the game's starting, like, I don't know, was it 635 now? So what what uh, what time are you usually at the field then? I'm usually at the field if it's a 635 game by probably – 215 220 something like that a lot of it'll depend on when the clubhouse time is but i'm saying i'd say that i'm usually at the park four to five hours beforehand and then uh the game takes you know two and a half three hours and then we do our post game show and then once we're done we head home and we prepare to do it again the next day so you're a 10 12 hour day for most most games most days most days but the nice thing is once you get to the off season you can largely do what you, you want to do. Yes. Yeah, so you got what r- roughly eight months season, then you have four months off. So right. um, you're you know, That's one of the things we talked about too, is like you're super scheduled, right? During mm-hmm. those eight months, travel, all your games for preparation, you know, listen to what you prepare for, for. So now off season comes. Mm-hmm. So what does that look like for you as well? It depends on the off season. Like this off season is different for me because my fiance Sean and I get married in December. Thank you. It's it's a lot of small details, and I'm really thankful that we have two good wedding planners who are helping us with this process. Because I'm watching one of my colleagues kind of plan their wedding and doing all the little stuff that the planners for us are doing, and I'm like, I don't know how you're doing this. I really <laughs> um, because there's there's so much that goes into it. So um, I'd say that like. It's, it's wrapping up some details with the, the wedding and it'll also be like Sean wants to go to the Finger Lakes again. We went up there this past uh, this past summer and and we and she loved it. So she's like, well, let's go back up in the fall. We have some friends that are there. So I'm like, sure, we, we can go up there in the fall. It's going to depend on when the Orioles season wraps up and we're all hoping for a long run into the playoffs. But. You know, I'd say we do some traveling. Um, we're big hockey fans. Um, some of it is because Sean's not a huge sports fan. She's very much of the the go team like variety. Like she likes coming to games, 
but like she's not going to know anything super in depth, but she understands hockey pretty well. And so we, we got into hockey. She also likes the fact that they're fights. Um, she doesn't like <laughs> hot. So it's very cold in, in hockey arenas, as you know. And so we go to a lot of Washington Capitals games and nice. uh, watch the right. Ra- we watch the Ravens on Sundays. Um, we're, we're, we went out to a last year. We went to a Navy game. They played Air Force with a great time. Yeah, so we'll probably do that again. And so some sporting events. We go to a bunch of wineries for wine people. Um, I blame her for that. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, it's it's that's kind of what our off season is. It's low key. And then I'll do maybe a little bit of broadcasting. I'm going to do some some hockey East games this year. I decided to start trying to do hockey last year. Really enjoyed it. It's it's a totally different style of broadcasting than baseball is. But I think that when you make it to the major leagues and when you reach a certain level of success, it's good to have passion projects for yourself where it's, I want to do this. And it could be anything from, I want to broadcast hockey to, I want to learn to play the piano. I want to learn how to do this or this. Uh, One year I did an improv class, uh, which was very helpful and a lot of fun too. Very hard, but uh, a lot of fun. And I think that if you have some just things that keep you going, then that makes you sharper and keeps you sharper. For sure. Especially so for your hoping career. To, I'm hoping to, to do that. But but yeah, I, I'd say that like during baseball season, I'm very scheduled. In the off season, I'm unscheduled for a certain part. And then I'm like, all right, I'm feeling like a bum. Like I need to like have a schedule of I want to do this today and this today and this today. And so I'll have all these notes in my phone and whatever. And it's like, all right, Sean's yeah. up. Sean's left for the day for school because he teaches that I'll be by myself. And it's like, all right, let's get this done. Let's get this done. Let's get this done. And nice. so that way you stay on top. Of it. All right. Any insights uh, for the Orioles? So for all our Orioles listeners, like perspective, uh, anything that you're finding special about our current Orioles team? Well, I'd say at the very beginning of the year, you were thinking this has a chance to be a really special group. And I think it still does. Um, but the thing that's been different about the Orioles this year than the last few years has been all the injuries. And it's you, you take a look at the Orioles injury list and you're like, kind of looks like an all-star team <laughs> that's just sitting over here on the bench. And, you know, there's some, some devastating losses like Kyle Bradish was incredible while he was here this year. And you feel terrible for John Means. And um, you're going to get some guys back, though, like Danny Coulomb is doing well. I think he's a big part of your bullpen. And Jordan Westberg, he's starting to take some dry swings. So hopefully he's back. I mean, getting an all-star like him back in the top sure. of your lineup, that, that can be a big difference maker. But I think, Lee, that the pitching is pretty good. The defense has been inconsistent, not nearly as good as it's been. But but I think that the real thing that's going to determine how far the Orioles are going to go is the offense. Um, and for the last couple of months, it has been one really good game, two not-so-good games. Um, one game where you put up a lot of runs – and another one where you can't get a runner in from third base with less than two outs. So th- this whole season to me is going to depend on how consistent can your offense be down the stretch. But I think the nature of the American league in general this year and the nature of baseball, but especially the American league is that it feels like nobody wants to win it right now. It, it feels mm-hmm. like everybody is up and down and up and down. And I think some of that is injury related, but, the Orioles and the Yankees are, I think, going to be in a, a foot race all the way to the very end. I think the, the second to last series, which is in New York, is going to be huge. And then I think also with the Orioles, the series right after that, too, is going to be pretty big as well. But I, I think this will come down to the very end. And a lot of baseball left. It may not feel like it, but but there's a lot of baseball left to be played and still a lot of a lot of things up in the air for, for not only the Orioles, but the, the entire American League. Okay, so um, how about an interaction with fans? What's your what's that been like lately? So uh, especially with the up and down season, injuries, all that stuff. How does that play into that interaction too? You know, it's it's great. I mean, I think that I think with fandom, like I think one thing with baseball that we have to remember is that that every baseball game, every baseball game is not like an NFL season. And I think that the way you look at an NFL season is that if you lose one, like that's a really big deal because there's not that many games. I think with a major league baseball season, you have to remember that there is a long stretch and there's going to be some good and there's going to be some bad. And, and, and I, I can understand a lot of the, the frustration that, that I hear from folks because it's like, you've waited for so long. The team is in this spot. You've got Gunnar Henderson, you've got Adley Rutschman, 
you've got Grayson Rodriguez, you have Corbin Burns, like, and I, and I get it, believe me, it's, you know, fandom is a powerful thing. And, and what I love about Orioles fans is how passionate they are and how passionate they have been, even through the worst of times right. that now you're at the best of times and, and you, you kind of, you get it, I, I understand it. Um, yeah. But, but I think just everybody wants them to be so good so badly. Everybody wants to go farther than they did last year and they'll have the opportunity yeah. to do that. Um, because once you get to the playoffs, you never know what's going to happen. It's just a matter of who do you face? How does this get started? How do your big guys perform? So you, you never know. And and like, remember, like for, for people that might be frustrated right now, if you were a Texas Rangers fan last year at this time, you were pretty frustrated too because you get to the very end of the year and it comes down to that last weekend, whether you're even going to be in the playoffs or not. And then you get into the playoffs and you roll the Rays, you beat the Orioles, and then you suddenly get all the way to the finish line and you, you win the whole thing beating the Diamondbacks. So, so I would just remember that there's some years where you feel like you're you're that incredible team, that the juggernaut that can't be stopped, and sometimes you can't be stopped. And other times it's you limp your way in or you maybe go up and down in your route to get to the – to the playoffs and get to the dance. And then once you get there, you suddenly become the bell of the ball. And that very well could be the Orioles this year. It just, it depends on the year. And, and it, you know, from a baseball season, from one to the other, um, you're never quite sure what you're going to get, but that's why, yeah. uh, that's why we do this. And that's why we watch this and love this. Right. I mean, I think last year with between the Baltimore uh, in Baltimore period, the Orioles and the Ravens, right. We had both had really good years, but it was just not enough to get over the line to win major mm-hmm. championships. So I know everybody's like, all right, where are we going to end up this year? So that's part of the thing, which you pretty much addressed in there. So um, how about personal um, like challenges of broadcasting, you know, just to end up here? Um, anything that like big challenges you faced that you had to overcome getting into this and then anybody thinking about broadcast, anything you would recommend? Those two things. Well, I'd say that trying to get here is the hardest part. I think trying to stay here is one thing. But I think if you have the right tools that, you know, and, and just and you're good to people and you work hard and you keep getting better, I think it increases the likelihood that the second one's going to happen. But the hardest thing is to get here. And there's only 30 of these jobs with what I do. And, you know, I do radio and some television, too. Like there was a moment I remember a couple of years before I ended up getting to the Orioles where I was in a relationship with somebody and I really cared about this person and my work was constantly getting in the way. And I felt like I, my relationship was stalling. It didn't end up working out. And then my career felt like it was stalling. And you have one of those moments, and we've all had them, where it's like, all right, am I going to push forward and keep going? Or am I going to just throw in the towel? And right. if there's something that I've learned about baseball broadcasting uh, or broadcasting in general, it is time and longevity does get rewarded a lot and if you consistently are good over a long period of time people will notice it might take a little longer for some rather than others but people will notice and you'll get your opportunity if you decide to throw in the towel which i've seen many of my colleagues do that i used to work with and it's and there's nothing wrong with that like everybody's journey is different and everybody wants different things but but I, I remember I started doing some interviews with this one place um, to do something that was kind of similar to what I was doing at the time, but but a little different. And I was just like, I, I got to like the third round of interviews and I'm thinking to myself, nah, I don't think I'm ready to give this up. And it's funny that the person that I was talking to used to be doing what I was currently doing. And I think they could tell they're like, this guy's great, but he doesn't have it out of him yet. Like he needs to keep seeing if this is going to going to work out and then if it doesn't or if he's like all right it's time then we can make a move but uh, i stuck with it and i'm glad i did because things got a lot better that off season and then after one more year from there um that's when i got the phone call to come to the orioles sometimes it's just sticking it out a little bit longer when you're not sure if you want to or not because it's very easy to to get another job from what I'm doing. It is not so easy to leave your job, go to do something else and try and get back in. That's a whole nother challenge. Sure. So that's like, I, I read it like I 
think of priming a pump, right? Like the old well pumps that you're yeah. pumping and pumping and pumping. And you're like pumping so hard. And then you've been pumping for so long, people will give up. And mm -hmm. it's like, if you just pumped a little longer, the water was just starting to trickle. And like, you're only seeing a little bit and then you're still pumping like crazy and it's just a trickle. And then all of a sudden, if you would have just continued, now all of a sudden you got this water and it doesn't take that much extra pumping as you did all the hard work that got you to where you're at. But so many give up before the trickle becomes anything. It's very true. And I think longevity is rewarded. I think consistency is rewarded. And like when I think of things that I want to do well every day, like I, I can focus on like I, I'm not sure how my broadcast is going to go. But if my process is consistent and I'm doing it the same way and it works and I'm trying to do little things to get better then that's where I think success comes down to. And sometimes judging yourself off of those things is a lot better than playing the comparison game of, well, I'm as good as this person. Why am I not there? I'm right. as good as this person. Why am I not there? And in broadcasting this day and age, like, you know, what I've noticed now is it's very different than it was 15, 20 years ago when it, when it comes to, you know, people getting hired and, um, and some of those, like trying to get in the minds of people is impossible. So just, I think if you just focus on being good and being yourself and improving and meeting people and being a good person, that's all you can really do. And the rest will kind of take care of itself one way or another. But that's what, that's what eventually that, that experience in the minors taught me was if you just focus on what you are doing and stop focusing on all the things you can't control, which are many like yeah. so many, then you're not only going to be a better broadcaster, you're going to be a better person and you're going to have a better chance of getting to where you want to go. But to go what you were saying about advice I would give to people that are trying to get into this, I would say, and I think this is true for like just about anybody and anything, be your own best self-evaluator. Um, broadcasting is a subjective thing. And the only person that's really going to know if you're making progress is you. So like, look at your work honestly don't get too excited when it's great, but also don't get too bummed when it isn't. Um, the old adage of it's never as good as you think it is and it's never as bad as you think it is is very true when it comes to broadcasting. Um, I would say that, you know, there's always a social media element to stuff now. And I've gotten better at it as I've as I've gone along here. Um, you know, let people know who you are as a broadcaster. And, and I try and find ways to do that, like, there's a reason I put up the videos of Ben McDonald scaring the hell out of me and that Ben does the same thing because that's really who we are. That's what we do. I mean, we are just a bunch of idiots who have got microphones and are talking about baseball every day. That's and, and like when I'm on air and I'm working with Brett Hollander, I really do call him William Brett Hollander like in real life all the time. And I remember last last year, maybe it was two years ago, we were at this holiday event a friend of ours is putting on. And we're standing at the bar and unknowingly there's somebody right in front of us who hears our voices and knows exactly who we are. And they're hearing our banter and our chatter. And he just looks back. He's like, you guys are exactly the same people that I hear every day. And I'm like, yeah, we are. We're, just, really, we're just a bunch of idiots here. Like we're a bunch <laughs> of idiots with microphones and we really are that way in, in real life. And so I think what you see is what you get. Be yourself. Don't try and be somebody that you're not. Um, realize that character does come into play in, in this and just go as long as you can and as hard as you can. If, if you have a chance to get help from people, take it. Maybe it's mom and dad helping you financially. Maybe it's getting critiques from people who are veteran broadcasters and using that stuff to your advantage and applying it. Um, and just be humble enough to realize that you don't have all the answers and be patient enough to realize that this is going to take a little while. Your friends very well might get jobs working at, in Wall Street for six figures or be doctors or whatever. And you might be grinding out the miners Monday through Friday and not making all that much money. And then suddenly things turn when you get your opportunity. And then suddenly all those people are still grinding it out. The difference is you're making just as much money as they are. And you're having a lot more fun while doing it. So yeah, enjoy it. Patience is often rewarded. Yeah. So just a recap there is like the compound effect, right? The compound over time, amazing what happens, but you have to be consistent and you have to be persistent at it too. So that's my three big things I'm always looking at is like 
the compounding of time, compounding with money, comp time and money, amazing what happens, but you have to put the work in. So when you're putting work and being consistent with it, amazing what it comes out of it. So, it, you know, people talk about motivation. I'm like, great. What is your behaviors? What are your behaviors that you're doing on a daily basis that, that you are motivated, that's motivating you? Yes, but you have to have some motivation through it. But if you just go out motivated and you don't have any activities of what you're doing, then what? So you have to make sure you have these habits that you're creating, which leads you to like, all right, these are the things I'm doing. I'm doing all this research before I go to a game. I'm spending four hours before a game even comes on. So I want people to understand, yes, if it's that four letter word, we have to work, right? We have to be consistent at it. We have to be persistent at it. And you're going to get knocked down on the way. It's not a perfect road. It's that squiggly line to get you to success. Um, and that's, that's basically what I want people to hear is like, everybody's got a journey. You all have one go get it. It sometimes it finds you right there. Your beginning journey is you didn't find it. It kind of found you. And I'm like, Hey, let me stay at it. I kind of like it. And you compound it over time. It wasn't, Oh, you just fell right into success. It was a lot of hard work. Took me years to, to become a, a overnight success story. That's what a, somebody that's a mentor of mine once said, he's like, it took me 20 years to become an overnight success. And it's true. And, and it's, it's not easy and it, and it does take time and it does take preparation. It does take some luck. I mean, that's, that's the one thing that you, you can't consider. And I think we all wish in some way, shape or form that we can control being in the right place at the right time. And that's, right. that's something that's impossible to do. But if you prepare and if you're good to people and if you're persistent without being obnoxious and all these other things, then you're going to increase the likelihood that you will be in the right place at the right time. And humble and kind. Exactly. Because here's the thing, like, you never know who's watching and you never know who's listening. That's what that's what uh, that's what sometimes you have to tell yourself is that even in bad games, you never know who's paying attention and you never know when you're going to be making a first impression on somebody, especially if you're in broadcasting. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this story. I was doing an Orioles Yankees game a few years ago and I was speaking or my agent was speaking to this executive at this network and I won't go into who it was, but, but this person, like my agent sent him like the walk-off call I had Anthony Santander hits a walk-off homer against the Yankees goes into the left field seats. This was like, I think maybe two years ago. And my agent was like, Hey, to this person, you should listen to Jeff, like do this. He's like, Oh, I was, I heard the thing live. Like I was listening the whole time. Exactly. Right. Like, and like that was a good game, but even so, they might be like, "Well, how does he do when it's a bad game?" Like right. it's like for me, it's easy to call a home run. It's easy to call a touchdown. It's easy to hit a big moment. I think to a point, like you know, calling a touchdown, calling a home run, that's the easy stuff. The hard stuff is, all right, it's twelve to one. It's the fifth inning. How are we going <laughs> to the last four or five innings of this broadcast? Because right. it's probably not getting any better. And sometimes it's you're winning and sometimes you're losing. And you have to figure out how to, to entertain and to, to keep people with you. And I think that our group does that as well as anybody because we can we can throw some stuff against the wall because we've had a, had a lot of experience doing it. Remember the first two years I was doing this with the Orioles, like – wasn't it wasn't great like there were 110 <laughs> losses and it was COVID. And there was all kinds of stuff going on but um yeah it, it's it's just remembering that you never know who's listening and you never know who you're trying to reach for the first time and and also like for me like when you're out and about you never know who notices that it's you you're never sure if somebody's paying attention and monitoring what your behavior is and so you've got to you've got to be paying attention Morals are always on display. Yes, they are. So I'll never, I'll never forget, it was a big CEO of a company and he was going through the, the uh, TSA, you know, check line and at the airport and the guy was giving, I think it was actually a lady was giving the TSA people just a hard time, like causing a ruckus and everything else. And I guess, you know, he's seen it from a distance and he ended up letting her go, like basically end up costing her a job at some point. So I was like, wow. I mean, this was somebody that was a high level executive in a company that you're going off and treating people this way. That does, that's not a good look for your company. So if you're coming across, so just think of how you, how you treat people, be humble, be kind, 
do the hard work and amazing what comes out of it. So Jeff, I want to thank you so much for being on here. I much appreciate sure. your day off and uh, enjoy it there in Detroit. And then I'll see you again soon. So thanks so much. We really enjoyed it. We'll uh, talk to him. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff.